Can you check if you can hear the voice? Can you hear me? Okay. Great. So, we'll get started. Uh, apologize, I couldn't come here on Monday because my daughter was sick. Um, so, what I wanted to cover today is lag compensator design. So, we were discussing lag compensator on Friday or, I don't know, 10 days ago. And the idea of using lag compensator is that you want to improve the steady state error performance with respect to some input. So um, that's where we use lag compensator. It has the form K S plus Z over S plus P, and Z is much, much greater than P. Okay. So here is the problem which we were discussing in one of the previous classes. So the system was G of S equals to one over S square. Uh, can someone remind me what was the performance specification? Uh, this performance TS less than equal to four seconds. Thirty-five percent. Sorry. Those are the only two things? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the we designed a lead compensator. So let me define denote it by G lead of S, which was eight point one S plus one over S plus three point six five. Okay, so this was the lead compensator that we had designed. So let's consider the following situation. We have R of S. We want to design a lag compensator. We don't quite know what that will be. So let's wait till we get there. We have a lead compensator 8.1 S plus 1 over S over 3.65. Then I have 1 over S square. And then E of S. <coughs> okay. Let's say the third performance specification is if RS is equal to 1 over S cube, so it's an acceleration command, acceleration input, then I want the steady state error to be less than or equal to 0 0.05. Okay. So remember that if you have these two specifications that cannot be met by the original system, the closed loop system, then you have to use a lead compensator to place the poles at an appropriate place. And we did that already in the previous class. Now we want to improve the error constant. So now we need to use the lag compensator to improve the error constants. So let's find out what the error would be if we did not use a lag compensator. So if this block was not there, so this directly connected to the lead compensator, what the error ESS would be for RS equals to 1 over S cube. 
So what's the ES transfer function? It's 1 over 1 plus GCG R of S. So right now my GC con comprises only of this lead compensator. So let's com compute what this is going to be. So R of S is 1 over S cube and 1 over 1 plus 1 over S square, 8.1 S plus 1 over S plus 3.65. Okay, so I have done this uh, and I've gotten the Laplace transform of the error signal. So what's my ESS? It's limit S goes to zero, SES. So that's equal to limit S goes to zero S into 1 over S cube into S square. Okay, so I see some cancellations. And I get 3.65 over 8.1. What is this equal to? Let's see. Approximately. Zero point four five. Let me check if I'm correct. Yeah, zero point four five. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Um, so this is a pro okay. So this is zero point four five. So my steady state error is very high, and I need it to get it down to 0 0.05. Okay, so let's consider alpha, which is the steady state error without the lag compensator over the desired one, which is 0 0.45 over 0 0.05, which is equal to nine. So this is actual ESS. This is desired ESS. That gives me by how much I, by what factor I need to increase the error constant by. And that's equal to nine. Okay, now I'm going to pick, so I can pick Z and P. Uh, I can pick Z and P according to my own wish. Uh, I don't have to pick a specific value. Uh, no, uh, I just have to make sure that the values of Z and P are very, very small. So Z and P is much, much less than one. So I can pick Z to be equal to 0 0.1 and P to be equal to 0 0.1 over 9. So let's pick 0 0.01. What did you say the 9 was? Just like, what's it supposed to be? So this 9 is the actual ESS over desired ESS. Is there a certain name for that? Or just alpha? That's alpha. Yes. Where did that equation come from? 
Which equation? S plus Z over S plus B. This one? Yeah. This is just the form of a lag compensator. Okay. So lead compensator has exactly the same form except that Z is less than P. Okay. Uh, and Z and P don't have to be small. They can be anywhere on the complex plane. That's well, on the real line. Sorry? That's for lead compensator? That's the lead compensator. Uh, but for lag compensator, you want Z to be greater than P, and you want both of them to be much, much smaller than 1. Yes? So I'm choosing the value 0 to be random. So it could be, value. yeah, pick any value, uh, 0 0.05 or something. So the thing is, Z has to be much, much smaller than the dominant root, dominant poles of the closed loop system. OK? So in this case, the poles are, oh, I didn't write where the poles are. So with this lead compensator, the poles of the closed loop system minus 0 0.98 plus minus 1.96j, I think, 1.96j. Okay, so these are the these are the dominant poles. So I just need to pick Z, which is much smaller than the dominant pole. So I pick 0 0.1. You can pick any other value um, for Z. And then my G lag would be S plus 0 0.1 over S plus 0 0.01. Okay? So if I use this compensator here, so let me S plus 0 0.1 over S plus 0 0.01, then I will meet all these three performance specifications. Okay, so I achieved these two using a lead compensator because it required me to completely change the closed loop pole location, and then I used a lag compensator to meet the steady state error requirement. So we always assume K to be one for our lag compensator. Uh, the K value. Uh, yes and no, okay? Uh, so in this particular problem, you will assume k to be equal to uh, 1. And the reason for that is we have already designed k in the lead compensator. So you don't have to redesign k again. However, if you were using a purely lag compensator, there was no lead compensator then you will have to design k to make sure that the closed loop requirements are met. Okay? Yeah? So like what's the relationship between alpha, z, and p? Like so we want... Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good point. So this is z over p. Alpha is equal to z over p. So that's how we yeah. design the lag compensator? That's right. That's right. So in the lag compensator, alpha is equal to z over p. I think in lead compensator, it was p over z, if I'm not mistaken. But we, it, we didn't really use alpha in the, no, we did. In the body plot approach, we did use alpha. But. Do you always want z and p to be much less than 1? Yes. For lag compensator, yes. Yes. And the reason for that was discussed in the previous class, so I know it has been a while back, but if you have a root locus, so if you look at the root locus for this particular system, so lead compensator along with 1 over S squared system, the it looks something like this. So this is the root locus for R locus of 8.1 S plus 1 
over S plus 3.65 and uh, what is that, S square. This is the root locus and my at gain k equals to 1, so that's why I'm picking the gain k of lag compensator equal to 1. So at that location, my closed loop poles are right here. These are the three closed loop poles. Uh, or I should just write gain equals to 1. Okay, and this is the one you see here. So we don't have any k there because gain k is equal to 1 for the root locus at the dominant poles or at the desired poles. Uh, and if I pick my p and z very, very close to origin, I don't change the root locus by a whole lot. The root locus still looks something like this. So the root locus will change a little bit by addition of lag compensator, but, but, but not significantly. And that's why we pick, well, because we pick Z and P close to origin, we don't actually change the root locus, but we change the error constant of the system. Okay, so I think, uh, I want to now get at the other question, where is, how do you pick K in the lag compensator? Um, so that was your question. So I want to get to it. But before that, before I proceed to that, any questions so far? Yes. So every time we design like the lead lag compensator, we always start with the lead first? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because it could be the situation that your lead compensator automatically satisfies the error constants as well. So then you don't have to design a separate lag compensator, but if you have to satisfy the error constant, then you need to have a lag compensator as well. What's the arrow for going from gain equals one to the GC? Yeah, so if you look at the root locus of the lead multiplied by the system transfer function, uh, I have the dominant poles of the closed loop system, right? Uh, so the dominant poles, uh, would have gain k equals to 1. So remember the root locus, if you probe the point, you get a gain value, right, and the pole location. So at gain k equals to 1, you will have the pole location as minus 0 0.98 plus minus 1.96 j, and this one, and they meet these performance specifications, okay? So what's it have to do with the lag? Yeah, so you don't have to add a gain k term, in fact, in Remember, lag compensator has k, s plus z, s plus p. So this k is equal to 1. And that's because this k is equal to 1. OK. Any other question? No. OK. So now let's look at the situation where we did not have a lead compensator. Uh, we just wanted to change the error constant. So how, how would we compute the value of gain k here? So I am going to split a lead compensator into S plus Z over S plus P. Okay. Let's pick some transfer function g of s, 1 over s, s plus 1.
okay? The root locus for this particular system is going to look something like Okay. This is what the root locus would look like for G of S. And let's say I want the desired poles to be at this location. So by a stroke of luck, uh, the desired location is actually on the root locus, so we don't have to design a lead compensator for that. We can use a simple gain K to place the poles of the closed loop system at these desired locations. So this is, gives you gain K. When you probe this point on the root locus, it gives you the gain K. And then to satisfy the error constant, you get the value of Z and P and you get the value of z over p, pick z and p very, very close to the origin, and you create this particular compensator, s plus z over s plus p. And then k multiplied by, so the k in k is obtained from the root locus, and s plus z over s plus p is obtained from the steady state error specification, and that's how you get the lack compensator of k s plus z over s plus p, okay? So in this particular situation, what happened was you had the desired performance specification, but you were able to meet the performance specification, the transient performance specification using just a simple gain K controller. You didn't have to use a, a lead compensator because you didn't have to move the root locus in some other direction. Does that make sense? So, you use lead compensator only when you have to move the root locus somewhere else, okay? If you don't have to move the root locus, you can just use a simple gain K controller to place the poles at the desired location. Any question so far? Question, no? Okay. Okay. So that co we come to an end of uh, lead lag compensator design. Now, of, of course, as we have mentioned before, uh, whenever you have a system and you want to design a controller, you essentially use a cascaded controller where you use a lead con compensator to place the closed loop poles in a desired at desired location so as to meet the transient performance specification. You design the lag compensator to meet the steady state error conditions uh, and you cascade them. So this is lead plus lag compensator, right? And that allows you to meet all these performance specifications at once, okay? Now if you need to move closed loop poles even further, you might have to use a couple of lead compensators. So the first two performance specifications were satisfied by the lead compensator? Yes. And the third one we used for the lag compensator? That's right. Okay. We cannot satisfy, so the, the timing specification and percentage overshoot, it's always gonna be lead <coughs> compensator? Yes. Okay. And then lag compensators, when you wanna change R of S or when no, when you want to change the E of SS, e ESS, so steady state error, corresponding to some input. So it could be a step input, it could be a ramp input, or it could be an acceleration input. Yeah? Are we saying lag compensators, they never will affect settling time or the percent overshoot, or just in this case? Um, so whenever you have Z and P much, much less than one, they will not change the transient specifications at all. Okay. Okay. Only if you pick Z and P that are non-trivial, so one, two, five, ten, then they affect the transient specification, but otherwise they don't. 
Okay. All of these numbers, of course, I'm saying one or five or 10, but all of these numbers are decided by where the closed loop poles or the open loop poles of G of S is. Yes. Um, is that still a lag compensator if the Z is greater than P so as to not mess with the root locus? Yeah. So, yeah. The so the reason why I'm using root locus is because yeah. the, the transient specifications are met using a simple gain K controller, yeah. but not the steady state error specifications. But if you had the, so going this way on the x-axis, if you had whole pole zero, right. wouldn't that mess with it? Which is what that calls for? Oh. Uh, I wish there was MATLAB installed on this so I could show it to you. It will not, because okay. the closed loop poles are here, which is far, far away from the origin. Okay. Okay. So even if you put S plus 0 0.1 over S plus 0 0.01, okay, and then 1 over S, S plus 1, the root locus will change only very slightly around this area, but the dominant closed loop poles would still remain okay. these values. Yes? Uh, when we were, used to be talking about like settling 10% overshoot, right. I thought it was like the poles that were closest to the imaginary axis had right. the strongest effect on that. Right, right, right. But in the case of the lie compensator not affecting those things, aren't those poles still really close to the imaginary axis? Yes, they are not affecting it. Uh, and I'll tell you the reason for it, uh, but I don't know how much of it is easy to understand. In intuitively, the reason is as follows. Remember that when we have uh, y of s in the form of some complicated expression, you can use the partial fraction approach to change it into a over s plus p1 plus a over s plus p2, sorry, a1, a2, an over S plus Pn, right? Um, so how the signal gets affected also depends not just on P1, P2, and Pn, but also A1, A2, and An. So it will turn out that for a lag compensator, this value of A1 is going to be very small, okay? In comparison to A2 all the way up to An. And that's why the lag compensator will not really affect the transient performance that much, but it will affect the steady state error. Okay. Any other question? So the rule of thumb is the dominant poles are the one that is closest to the imaginary axis. But what is hidden in that rule of thumb is that one also has to look at what these uh, parameters for partial fraction would look like. And so in the case of lag compensator, because Z and P is very, very close to origin, these values are very small, and the other values dominate the transient performance. Any other question? Okay. Now there are other situations where, which you know, as you go into uh, real world and as you start designing controllers, some of the things that you need to worry about is saturation and material degradation. Okay. Uh, okay. So I give you a system and I give you the performance specification for the closed loop system. And for some reason you seem to think or you came up with the idea that if I use a PI controller, I'm going to meet all the performance specifications. And I said, great, uh, let's build that. And you build it, and then you realize 
that the actuator cannot really follow the PID signal because of saturation. Okay, so let me give you an example. You have a, you know these faucets, okay, so you can turn it on and turn it off. And when you turn it on, if it is completely on, then it is completely on. That's it. It's saturated at that particular point. So if your PID says, oh, turn it on all the way up to 1.5, there is nothing you can do about it. It has to, your input, or rather your output of GC has to be less than or equal to the maximum that your actuator can take. And in this case, the actuator is a knob which goes from 0 to 1 and that's it. It cannot go to 1.5. So if your output is absurd, then your actuator cannot follow that output and therefore your entire control design approach will fail. And for those situations, you have to realize that, okay, you cannot use a PI controller for that. So you might have to use a lead controller to move the closed loop poles in an appropriate location. But at the same time, you have to make sure that under the nominal operating conditions, the controller will not output a command that cannot be followed by the actuator, okay? And that's the reason why instead of using one lead controller, you might have to use two lead controllers, or instead of using a PI controller, you might have to use a lead controller uh, because you could have saturation in your actuator and you need to satisfy those saturation. You need, your controller needs to satisfy the constraints imposed by the saturated, by the saturated uh, actuator. The same thing happens for material degradation. If you have a resistor or a device in a power electronic circuit and you design a PI controller or something, some other form of controller which increases the temperature of the device, it is undesirable because it would change the material properties over long periods of time. Uh, which is an undesired change in the system. So you will have to worry about picking a different form of controller, which may not be as good, but at the same time, it will make sure that you never exceed the temperature specifications that are marked on the, on the device, on the material, that this should only operate under 150 degrees Celsius and not above 150 degrees Celsius. So, those are the things that you need to keep in mind, and that's not part of this class, but it's something that will affect you in your day-to-day -day activities uh, when you start designing controllers for actual systems. So naturally, in chemical plants, people worry about saturation. So you have a nozzle, you have a tube. You can only push so much fluid through the tube, okay? So your controller has to respect that particular constraint imposed by the size of the tube. Uh, if you have a knob, you can only open it to one, you, so you, the controller can only have zero to one uh, output, it cannot have an output that is greater than one because you cannot open a completely open knob. And for electronic devices, uh, material degradation is one of the major issues, so you want to make sure that you don't design a controller that degrades the material of the underlying system. Yeah. So I guess when you're saying we want to design it so we don't I guess reach saturation. Under the nominal operating conditions. So yeah. would that be essentially limiting our maximum K or how would you? It would limit a lot of, so for instance, PI controller requires you to integrate the errors all the way until now. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. You integrate the error, the error is too high. Okay. In the initial phases, then the error becomes too high. You integrate it, now you have an input that's too high. So if you cannot implement that algorithm or under, under the nominal operating conditions, if the error in the initial phases is too high, you cannot actually implement that algorithm on an actuator or implement that output on an actuator. And you might have to use a lead compensator in order to limit the amount of integration you are doing. Okay. okay. So that's what I meant. Or, or a lag compensator, whatever is needed for whatever reason you're using the controller to meet all the specifications, you also need to have an additional uh, constraint that the output of the controller under the usual operating conditions must be less than or equal to the saturation limits of the actuators. Okay. Okay. 
so that ends the lead and lag compensator design. Now I want to talk about sensitivity of systems with respect to certain variables. And then we will move on to robust control system. So as far as the final exam is concerned, today is the last day for final exam topics, so lead and lag compensator. So after this, robust control system is part of the syllabus, but I'm not going to consider it as in the final exam. So this is uh, too much already. You don't want to have more material for the final exam. Okay. Robust control system. So, as we have mentioned in the past, uh, there are situations where your system undergoes degradation over short period of time over, or over long periods of time and you want to make sure that your system is robust to such changes in the dynamics. So I posted a video on uh, Carmen about how GE tests their aircraft engines and you might have seen, uh, I don't know if you have seen it or not, but they basically put a bird in the engine to see how the engine behaves when a bird hits the engine, okay? And the engine has to behave in a reasonable fashion, it cannot just drop out of the sky, okay? So, so whoever designed the first aircraft engine, perhaps, well, they, maybe Wright brothers thought of it, maybe they didn't think about bird hitting the airplane, but certainly at some point of time, people realized that well, the air, when the aircraft is flowing at low, um, low altitude, then the birds could hit the aircraft and therefore the engine has to be robust their operations have to be robust to a bird hitting the engine, okay? And that's just one example. Uh, you could have cracks within the engine. Uh, you could have some of the temperature sensors failing within the aircraft engine. Um, uh, you could have low oxygen conditions within the engine. And under all these situations, your system still has to operate and provide uh, a reasonable amount of uh, uh, performance uh, under these stressed conditions, okay? We've already talked about transformers and power electronic devices which, whose lifespan is of the order of 30 to 40 years, okay? So it has to operate and meet all the desired specifications for such a long period of time, which means that the controller has to, ro has to be robust to all the things that the transformer is going to see in the next 30 years of life. So that would include rain, uh, heat, and extreme cold weather events, okay? And one of which was just two weeks back. Uh, so in order to um, understand what robustness means, we first have to understand the concept of sensitivity. Uh, so let's say I have a system and I want to understand the sensitivity of the closed loop system with respect to K, which is the gain parameter, okay? What do you think, how do you think should the sensitivity be, be, be quantified, okay? So we want to quantify this notion of sensitivity, how sensitive the system is with respect to changes in a specific parameter, how would you try to quantify it? Any thoughts? Yes. Kind of mathematically, but like the derivative of the output signal. Kind of. Derivative of the output signal. So here I have an output signal Y of S. Input is R of S. So your name is Jeff, right? Your name is Jeff, right? So Jeff's idea, 
you have become world famous because this <laughs> video will be uploaded on YouTube. <laughs> so you want to take the derivative of ys with respect to k. Is that what you want to do? Sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, sounds good to you. Uh, any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, how about I make it ys over rs? So I want to take the derivative of closed loop system with respect to k. Is that good enough? Or should we have something more complicated? So how do you measure a change in k? So let's think about it. I have a system with gain k equals to 1, and I have another system with gain k equals to 1,000. Okay? And the gain changes by 0 0.1. So if k is equal to 1, and the new gain k tilde is equal to 1.1, and I have k equals to 1,000, and k tilde is equal to 1,001. No, 1,000.1. So which of these two changes are big in terms of changes in parameters? So the first one seems to be a big change. So how would we capture what is a big change and what is a small change? Ratio. Ratio. Ratio of what? K over K delta. Delta K over K, perhaps, right? So that ratio is pretty high here, whereas in this case, that ratio is pretty small. So in fact, that's how we define sensitivity. So sensitivity is percent change. I shouldn't say percent change in transfer function, but change in closed loop transfer function over change in I Well, let me change it. So sensitivity is delta G over G over delta K over K. I think that's right. So this is uh, termed as the sensitivity of the system you would want, ideally. So this is, of course, it looks like a transfer function. And what you would want is, under the nominal operating conditions and the nominal values of k, you want the sensitivity to be as small as possible. Okay? So that even if you have modest change in the value of gain k over a certain period of time, because the system is insensitive, okay, so sensitivity is, if the sensitivity is small, then the system is insensitive to changes in the parameter k, okay? Now, of course, I'm using the parameter k, but you could have parameters within g of s also to which the, you want the sensitivity to be as small as possible. So, ideally, want sensitivity, sensitivity to be small at normal operating conditions. Yes? small sensitivity affect the performance though, or? Uh, so it might. Uh, so there are multiple things when you talk about performance. Performance in what sense? Okay. So if it is just uh, percent overshoot less than equal to blah 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 and settling time less than equal to something, 
Um, it probably would meet the performance specification uh, under, per under small perturbations, but not really under large perturbations. Okay. okay. So, um, so naturally, when you are designing, say, a transformer, you must have some historical data about how the gain K changes over 20, 30 years period based on the stress history. And then you want to make sure that you design your controllers in such a way that you minimize the sensitivity or you reduce the sensitivity under the normal operating conditions for that particular transformer. So let's look at an example. So I have a G of S equals to 1 over S, S plus 1. So then my closed loop system transfer function T of S over R of S, sorry, Y of S over R of S is K G over 1 plus KG, so that's K over S square plus S plus K. I want to understand the sensitivity of this system with respect to K. So if I perturb the K a little bit, how is the overall system's transfer function going to change? So so that's equal to delta t over t over delta k over k or in the derivative form del t over del k multiplied by k over t of s. Okay, so let's try and get this expression. So what's the derivative of t with respect to k? Looks like a pretty bad expression, s square plus s plus k square. Oh, actually it's not that bad. Multiplied by k over t of s, so t of s is k over Looks like there is quite a bit of cancellation. So this is given by STKS. Okay. Okay, so all of you follow up to this point. So we denote sensitivity by S, transfer function S. So this is sensitivity of transfer function T with respect to parameter K. And it's a function of uh, small s, which is the uh, S domain variable. So this is given by s square plus s over s square plus s plus k. Okay. 
what's the value of this sensitivity function when s is small? So when s is close to 0 omega, so s j omega omega close to 0, what is s t k j omega? So at low frequencies, what is the sensitivity? Close to 0. What about when omega is very, very large? What is the sensitivity? S T K J omega. It's almost equal to 1. So what we are seeing here is that this particular system, so what is this system? This is K 1 over S, S plus 1 and I give it a sinusoidal input and let's assume that the gain k changes over from morning to evening or night to morning because of the temperature variation. So if this omega is small, the system doesn't even feel it because it's insensitive to any change in k. On the other hand, if your omega is large, the system feels it a lot because the transfer function changes significantly when the gain k changes uh, significantly. So you want to have system, so you want, so in this particular system, if you have to make it insensitive at certain values of omega, you have to pick the value of gain k sufficiently high so that small changes in the gain k will not lead to uh, a very different behavior from the system. Now, of course, this is just one form of uncertainty or sensitivity that you could have. Uh, typically, your controller will not be a simple gain controller. It could have other terms, and so you want your system to be insensitive to other terms as well. <coughs> yeah? Is one like high for sensitivity? Like what's the generally considered to be high? Uh, so one is not high, but uh, certainly you can see that the system is sensitive, more sensitive for large values of omega in comparison to low values of omega, right? Uh, there are many examples where, oh, I see. So in the Bode plot, if your so we will see in a bit. In your body plot, if your plot is decaying to zero at high values of omega, like your magnitude is going to minus infinity at high values of omega, then your sensitivity will go to one. Okay, so uh, in some sense, yes, one seems like a high value. Okay, because that's uh, that's true for many of the real system where the gains, where the magnitude of the body plot is going to minus infinity. So it's log of, we'll get to it in perhaps the next class because today we are out of. So in the next class, I'm going to talk about, uh, go deeper into this sensitivity function and talk about different kinds of uncertainty that your system could have. And uh, we'll study the, uh, robust control in the next class. From a terminal, I'll just say